What we'll do is we're just going to talk basic, basic lighting principles. Uh, we're going to do some different lights, pop some different lights in and out that are uh, different types of lights so you can see how they'll work in effect. Uh, what we're dealing with is three-point lighting, referred to as such because there are three points of light. The key light, which is normally your main source of illumination, your fill light, which is set to a lower ratio to try and create modeling, as you can see in here. For instance, if you bring that Leco up slightly, you'll start to see how this will balance out this uh, 15, I think, or no, what is it? It's 12. Yep. See, and bring it up all the way. See how it starts to flatten out? And now you've lost a lot of the definition in here and that. If now you start to fade it down slowly, you'll start to see, okay, hold it somewhere in there. You'll start to see now that you've got a different ratio. Ratios are the relationship of the key to the fill light. Sometimes uh, it's called high contrast or low contrast. And the contrast is the difference between the brightest spot and the darkest spot on the face or the, the scene. Uh, often it, it's referred to as, like I say, contrast. You'll either hear the term high contrast, low contrast. High contrast being when there is an extreme ratio. For instance, bring, just bring that thing down. That's completely now, you can see that basically we've lost all of this fill over here. So the ratio now is probably about three to one. In uh, things like drama, or even like noir, you'll see things like um, five to one, six to one ratios because it's really dark. Uh, comedy, dance, that's low contrast. So you have a lot of light. So you have a very small differentiation between the darkest point on the scene and the, the lightest part. So that's like normally variety shows, things like that. Dance numbers are very brightly lit because they're not dramatic. So in a lot of cases uh, when you're lighting, again, you'll have a main source of illumination. Fill can be uh, bring that up about 50%. That's good, right in there. And then the th second light being the fill. The third light uh, is normally a backlight, which the reason you are lighting is because you're dealing with a two-dimensional plane. And your attempt is to create a three-dimensional illusion within a two-dimensional reality. So the object is to try and create separation. So in this case, and if you bring that backlight down, the hair light, see how she starts to fade slightly into the background. When you bring it up, it gives that hair light an edge that helps bring it away from the background. A lot of times when you're setting things up, it'll be a relationship to how far forward or backward you need to be. Other people are different. For instance, uh, we had Polly up here one time, and being blonde, her hair is much lighter, so you would need less light. Darker objects require more light. Uh, and in some cases, somebody who's, who's blonder or, or fair haired, then you would even keep it down lower so it doesn't look like they're burning up, because sometimes you can literally make it look like their head's on fire. Uh, so in a situation, what you want to do is do that. Sometimes on occasion, you will get a light back over here somewhere, and they'll pop it in, and they'll refer to it as a kicker, which will hit just in here which will give you a slight separation on the fill side so that you are lower here in the cheek, a little higher here on the back ear. So they'll sometimes do that. Uh, different types of lighting. I mean, TV lighting to a degree is like lighting like this, which is from a grid, which is a little tricky sometimes because it's a fixed angle. Uh, it isn't quite so easy like when you have floor instruments just to go ahead and pull them out and move them around. Uh, TV grid lighting is, is kind of an art that uh, is, is different than lighting from the floor, that kind of thing. Uh, I lost my train of thought where I was going with this. Huh, okay, well, I'll probably find it somewhere. Uh, so in this case, like I say, we've just basically set a key there and a fill there. We could actually swap them if we want, bring this one up all the way and start to dim this one down. Okay. Now, See how you can see that this is working so that she's actually got a nose, nice nose shadow here. This is almost referred to as what they refer to as Rembrandt lighting when you get this sort of splash on the cheek right here. So that's kind of nice and that's the whole reason you want to create that. I mean, if you're using soft lights, you often will just flatten something out. Sometimes it's just about illumination. It all depends. Uh, 
in a case like this, now this is starting to look much more dramatic. The ratios are completely different here. So this is a much higher, but then you get, like I say, you get more definition with this than you are with this one. So, and you can swap them back and forth. And so in this case, if you were doing, say, multiple interviews, you could move your key if you needed to or change your background to try and give it a slightly different look. Although often if you're doing mass interviews, you don't want them to look so different from each other as to seem like they're incongruous or they're not part of the same package. So in this case, like I say, we've just hung, this is referred to as a Fresnel instrument, which is a 1K, I do believe, that has a, a, a lens in it that focuses the light. The light itself is on a parabolic reflector that has a, a rack that moves forward and backwards. Moving it forward floods the light because the light is closer to the front of the lens, so it spreads. As you move the carriage backwards, it spots the light into the lens, so it gets tighter. And then you have barn doors for additional type of just cleaning up the light and doing it where you want to try and keep it where you want. In a lot of cases, you might come in, if, if the light was spilling some certain places, you might want to uh, put flags or cutters or in some way control the light a little better. But that's often difficult when you're up in a grid versus being on a floor. So in this case then, like I say, is we can, we can change the key or the fill depending on what we have. In this case, we're using this one now as a key, which is a Leco. And this is a, a lensed instrument that has shutters in it. It's more used in theatrical applications, although I always used to use them quite a bit because they worked rather well. And the fact that they have shutters in them allows you then to slip the shutters in uh, on all four sides, which allow you to control the light a little better. Uh, for instance, that's what we've done with these back here, is that this light has the shutters in it, so it's giving this kind of a slash, whereas if we open the shutters up, you'd see a much more greater defini definition in here. So what we're just doing with this is just to throw some light on the background to again provide some depth and separation. Bring down both of those colors. See, now the background just is flat. So if there's no light on it at all, it doesn't create any of that separation. So all you're really doing is just to show that there's something back there. And the question becomes, what is your importance? You light what you need to see. It's often just as important what you do light as what you don't light. So in this case, you know, go ahead and bring those up slowly then. Bring up the red, or just the blue one first. Which would be camera, camera right, yeah. See how that just starts to pull up slightly in there. And now you can actually see there's a background back there. Now when you bring the red in, it'll contrast that blue, which will give you the definitive reality that there is something back there. So it just doesn't float into it. And again, it's, it's you know, depending on where you can place the person. You often, you, you sometimes are stuck having them right on a background, which becomes problematic if you're trying to get backlight or anything in. Uh, because you just, you need an angle. I mean, David and I did something in here with some students a couple of years ago uh, from the TFM department, and I was surprised because when they set the chair, they put the chair right against the background. And so I was like, okay, well, where are you going to get your backlight in? So it was just, you know, and in some situations you're forced, uh, if you say had to go, if you didn't have the ability to separate from the background, that's when you might want to use a kicker or something else that would give you a little more definition on the face, which will help separate a bit from the background. So we use these two lights. Let's go ahead and bring those down. And we will, the, uh, these two, these first ones, yeah, we're using. Now, in the same way, those are direct lights and they're unfiltered. Is this one? No. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure which way we got to go. Striker? Yeah. Okay, that's that one. Okay, bingo. Now you can see that there's a much different relationship between the two lights. And then this is, has to do to a large degree with proximity. And so in this case, plus these, now you see that the color is slightly different. We white balance to the other lights. There is a possibility that you may have to, if you change lighting, often white rewhite just to be sure. This looks a little blue to me in my eye right now, even with what we've got here. But in this situation, you can then dim these. And again, you see how you've created a much greater contrast ratio here to here. 
And the way you can adjust the lights is you can, on these, you can actually turn a head on and off, or you can move the proximity of the light. You could even come around further if you want to fill, or almost make it a side light in some cases, which again, you should be able to see the difference because now you've got a very defined line running right down the center of her face, which is really unattractive in my opinion. But, and in some cases, they'll choose to go with such a minimal amount of fill in, uh, Clint Eastwood, who normally makes good movies, made a real piece of crap when he did uh, Edgar with Leonardo DiCaprio. And I think they did a lot of stuff where they literally did it in post and they would black out almost one side of the face. So they made one side really dark and the other really light to the point that the line was so defined I was almost convinced it was in post and it wasn't done on set. But now you see you bring this around slightly and you can see that this starts to work a little better. And again, when the individual turns, you still maintain the modeling even when they return back. So in some situations, you know, when you're, you, you certainly, your camera angles would be different if you were doing like a two scene person like this. Because in some cases, if you've got a two person interview where they're like this, technically you can use the key on, you can use both lights as key and fill at the same time. Because this one would work as a fill for this individual, but it, or a key, but it would work for a fill for this person, whereas this side would key this individual here and then fill to here. So in the center, you'd have a little bit darker. And that's often the way they do news lighting, is you'll see that. And they'll just use double lights, and they'll, they'll put them up. They'll cross, cross light them as cross keys and fills. So you can see that the different types of light provide different types of illumination. Sometimes it, you know, you'll look and you'll think, God, that light isn't really aimed where it should be. Well, in some cases, you'll find that it isn't a direct lighting situation. But you know, you're only using it to give you what you need. So it doesn't always have to be on, let's see, is this, and now that, see, and that starts to flatten out again, but you can see that the fact that the key on that side is the dominant light, because it's going to throw, he's throwing a shadow to here. So normally your illumination, and when you see, when people shoot things, they'll often, uh, the scene is determined to a degree on what you might see if there's what's called a practical, like an existing light, like a lamp or something. Uh, those are referred to as practicals, lights that are used within the scene. And what you'll normally do with those is you'll put them on squeezes, which are dimmers, and swap out the globes often. And you'll go like with a 211, a 212, a different high intensity globe, and then you'll bring it down. So it won't really be as much lighting as it will be sort of a, a mood piece that suggests where the lighting's coming from. Although, I read an article once by uh, Barry Sonnefeld who shot uh, the Coen Brothers' early films up until Barton Fink. And when I saw Miller's Crossing, there's a scene where Gabriel, what's his last name? Burn. Burn, thank you. Is sitting next to a lamp. And uh, the funny thing is, is he's not, it isn't like he's hot here. The lamp is right here, but he's being keyed from this side. And my whole thing when I worked was like, okay, we want to try and recreate reality. Well, kind of opened my eyes when I read this article because he said, you know, I'm, movies aren't real. He goes, I'm not lighting for reality, I'm lighting to create a mood. Which really kind of changed my emphasis in the way I thought about lighting because I was always like, there's the source, that's the key, you know? Or even how uh, you can, we were doing something one day and, oh God, I can't remember the story on this one, but uh, somehow somebody put in a, a shiny board and they threw it in and it was real bright hit and I was like, What's with that? And they just went, oh, there's, there's a mirrored building over there across the street and the sun's hitting it. Well, there wasn't a mirrored building and the sun wasn't on it, but that's how he validated it. So half the time it's what you validate is what's going to work. You know, uh, often it's a question of time, energy, uh, equipment, what you have, what you don't have. Uh, these kind of situations in, in interviews are relatively simple because, again, you're not using a lot of light. But if you had situations like, for instance, if you have somebody like myself who has was losing their hair and has a high forehead, the angle is going to be important for both something like that and something like uh, glasses. Because what happens is, is if, if the, the, the big thing to remember is angle of incident equals angle of reflectance. Okay, that's a simple lighting rule that means the, the angle the light hits at is the angle the light is going to reflect at. So if the light is there and you have someone with glasses and you can see the light in there, 
then you need to either move this light steeper so that it moves it up and out. But then if you've got someone like with my hairline, then it starts to get hot. So you, you may have to supplement it with something else. But a lot of times those situations are solvable by either changing the angle of the light. So if you've seen that either glare, sometimes you'll just use makeup, sometimes with its glasses you'll end up moving the light either off axis more or farther back. But you normally want, and with three point, the standard thing is like 45 degrees, 90. But those are all just starting places. These aren't hard and fast rules by any means. Uh, you can, you know, it's basically it's what works and what, you know, what you can do with what you have and the time you have. I mean, that's often, you know, the old joke about you get it good, fast, or cheap. You get good and fast, it ain't cheap. You get cheap and fast, it ain't good. You know, so you're going to cancel one of them when you're trying to do that. And production is always a sort of a hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, you know. Uh, but so this again, you can see that you're using different types of light in this case to create the same effect, but you're getting a very different look. And again, that could be to some degree that the cameras have not been re-white balanced or the fact that uh, these lights are just bluer in nature. That's the other thing is that, see, and these aren't dimmable because when you can dim a light, there's really two types of lights. Currently, while I haven't lit anything in 20 years, the philosophy is no change, there's no changes, although the technology has changed drastically and is in the midst now of having LED lights take over. But the main kind of lights you have are normally referred to as tungsten and daylight. And they represent portions of the color spectrum which are rated in kelvins. And tungsten is normally rated at 3200 kelvin uh, and daylight 56. And so you can, these sources are used, for instance, uh, it used to be with film that there was tungsten balance film and daylight rated film, whereas now you're using digital, you're white balancing to whatever you're doing. It's a little different. Uh, and I wasn't, uh, I wasn't working when they made the transition, so I'm not quite sure how that affects uh, things overall. Uh, the, God, I don't have any notes, and I, I got about six things going at once, and then I forget and I move on. The, uh, The difference between the two is, again, like I say, these are lensed instruments uh, and daylight can also be lensed instruments. There's just, uh, standard measuring, blah, 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 I haven't done this in a while, so it's sort of, sh but there are a tremendous amount of different lights and so there's just a million different ways to do the same thing often, you know. Uh, I mean, if you look at some of these things, there's soft lights, spotlights, floodlights, uh, tungsten, fernels, incandescent, HMIs, other lights, Chinese lanterns. I used to use Chinese lanterns all the time because I could put a real high wattage bulb in them and I could hang it in and they're real soft and they're easy to control and you can dim them. Uh, LEDs, which are the new type of lighting that are taking over, that are very... Uh, very efficient in regards to the fact that they don't use a lot of energy, that they're very lightweight, and the biggest thing, they are uh, UV neutral, so there's no bad rays, as well as the fact that they, they, don't, they don't heat up. Because when you get a bunch of lights up, it gets really warm in a studio real fast. There's also Kino flows or fluorescence. There's a whole bank of fluorescence and things like that that uh, are used, and I've seen things lit completely with fluorescence and that kind of thing too. In this case, like I say, the original setup we had, those were raw instruments in the sense that there was no diffusion and just that on them. Both of these have what are called shimeras. Shimeras are soft boxes that are basically built on the front of the lights uh, to create a diffusing effect. So it creates, it, in a sense, it makes the light bigger than it actually is while it reduces the intensity. So while you can make a big light smaller, you can make a small light bigger but at the loss of intensity because if you take a small light and put it through a silk or something diffused it'll make it a broader beam so you can make it bigger but in a sense you're going to lose some illumination you'll make the spread wider so again we're back to the fact that these are a much softer light than the others uh, personally I like the other ones more uh, but there are certain ways you can do this for instance you can fill you don't have to use lights in all these situations You can use reflectors or, and often outdoors when you're placing somebody, you don't place them into the sun. 
because what you're going to get is just going to get this front flat illumination. So what you want to try and do is sometimes place them so that you can get the sun hitting somewhere in here that will give you that modeling. And then you can fill. This isn't going to do real well because of the fact that, uh, but you can see how it's starting to pick up on the cheek. Even though, and, and with softer lights, it's going to be harder because you, have, you don't have quite that direct beam to gather that you would otherwise. Uh, but for instance, let's see this. Go ahead and bring up, uh, what is this one, 48? Yeah. No, we'll leave that down. Well, see now, because you're, you've got more light to gather, see how much brighter you can get it? because you've got a much more focused specular beam as opposed to one that is all over. So in this case, you know, and, and here then, even if you brought the person around, sometimes Phil isn't as necessary as you might think. I mean, this is, this is just flat. I mean, to me, you can see all this and you've got this working, but it's just too flat on my eye. That's why I would have picked it up with the other. But uh, see, and then that just, again, this is more like a kick in here where you're trying to bring something in against that chin and the back of the neck so that you're creating, again, a degree of depth in here. So you can do that by bringing in something in the back like that. So when you're shooting outdoors, that's what you're trying to do is use the, use the sun as a key light to a degree. Uh, and then you can use a card or anything like this. You know, certainly this, and I was using gold side, which is going to be less reflective than this side. The white is going to be a lot broader. But because of the placement on this and not having any additional fill light, that's why you've got this solid cheek line right there. Even when I fill it, that cheek line is still there. Until I can flatten it out slightly, but I'd really want to use fill to try and give me some definition in there. So again, it can be the same thing, like when you're outdoors, you basically are just going to fill, unless you've got big lights or using daylight lights. Uh, the other thing is about the LEDs, which is really neat, is these things are uh, wireless, which is pretty amazing to me, considering what they are. So let me do this. Bring that down. I want to take this. Oh, these are, oh no, okay, there it is. I was like, what? I was like, these guys are already three pin. And this will be new and wonderful for me because I've never worked with LEDs. So I really. Uh, you don't think it's a second. There's no beam out battery on the back. Ah, OK. Well, one of the things I can say is that if the sun is too overpowering, you can move to a tree or shaded area. But again, what you're going to be doing then is if you're looking out beyond it into something that's highly lit, you're going to be dealing with the reality that you're going to have a, a possibly washed out background because you're opening up to expose within the tree, tree area, the shady area. And then, so the background then can sometimes go bright or white. So. That's always tricky, but the thing is, is if you have the sun back here, then the objects that in the background are also not getting direct light. So in this case, then you open up and you can kind of balance to the two. So a lot of times that's kind of what it is, is a balancing aspect. Is this guy alive? Yeah. See, and I, uh, I don't need to plug him in, that's right. See, that's just confusing as hell to me. I'm like, wow, it's a light, you gotta plug it in. The only light that I don't have to plug in is a flashlight. Okay, now these are LEDs, and you can see how this one, unlike the others, is throwing a lot more light on the background. And especially when it comes up. Thank you. And I just put the spot on that side and figured I'd put the flood on this side. Here's your filters. Uh. See, now this looks much more, the light quality of these looks much more like sunlight to me than the others. I mean, see, and again, God, that is, this is sweet. This is sweet. Look how delicate that is. I mean, the dimming capabilities on it are so nice. 
See, what I'm curious right now is where am I getting this from? Yeah, I've never worked with these. These are really interesting. Man, they are bright too. So these LEDs are, these are the new type of lights and these are dimmable and this one is a spot and that one is a flood. So they're slightly different in the way that they handle but boy they certainly are nice. So again, the ability to dim allows you that the ability to change the ratios and you can do that in a number of ways. You can dim the light, you can diffuse the light, you can uh, move the light closer or back or forth. In some cases, <clears throat> this is referred to as a silk. These come in, these are normally like cutters or silks. This is a silk, which is a diffusing element. And you can see in this case, and it's hard, it's a little tricky for me to see the monitor, but. Here, let me do this. So you've more or less set the balance now almost at the same, but now you can see that the main source of illumination is actually going to be the, the fill side now because that's going to be the brighter side. Uh, so in some of these cases, like I say, if you can, you can do this. This is basically mirroring what these lights are doing with the softness in front. Uh, again, a lot of times if you're in a case like this, if it's too bright in the front, you can always just bring up part of the light and, and uh, siphon off some of the heat that way. When you put a cutter in, if you put it closer to the light, this line will be softer. The closer you move it, the harder that light is, that line is. So often, if you know, it's like, if you get somebody who's an African American wearing a white shirt, you're gonna definitely have to knock it down. And you can either do that with diffusion like this, or they have nets, which are singles and doubles, that are basically light reducers. So in this case though, you've got the dimmers, which is a lot easier because in most situations when you're on location, you're really not using dimmers. You do, I mean, you have them, but it isn't something that you have like in a studio as much. And with these lights, the, the quality, the capability is so much greater, but you can almost see too is that you get the light all the way over here, whereas the other one, and again, this one's flat. That's one of the reasons is that if I, And again, see how that's throwing light all over the background now? So if you bring this down, now you can affect that background if you want, or if you wanted to, then you could cut it out. Again, something like, I do not believe it'd be right about here. So see all that spill on the background then. You can clear that out, whereas I'm still, I'm not affecting her. So the light at this point is off the background, but still open on her. So you can open and close this. And again, that line, depending on what you want to do, uh, how hard or soft you want to make it will be dependent on how close or how far away you place the flag. These are very nice lights. These are really something, man, they are just. Is there any sort of rule whether you'd use the flood or the spot as the key light? I don't think so. I mean, it wouldn't. I mean, I was just, because normally fills tend to be softer and wider and they're a lower, so I just put the spot in because I knew that would be a, a higher dynamic. Although basically with the ability to dim the way they do, you can almost mix and match them. You know, it's just, again, I, I, the, the color on the, the soft boxes looks blue to me. This looked relatively warm about 32. These look more like daylight to me as a regular sort of rule, but I've never worked with them again, you know? So, but it also, see, and it's kind of flattened out, same thing as before, I was, because I'm standing in the light. I was like, what's wrong with that? Mm -hmm. 
See, and you can change as you want to, as you start moving around, you can flatten that out even further. This light is interesting. But see, same thing again, is that now you've, a light like this, while it works, you're having to deal with more of controlling the background. And part of it is because there's a flatter angle here. If the angle is higher again like that, it's going to spill off and not go on the background. But these things reach farther than those lights too. So that's one of the things you consider. But a lot of times, like I say, if you put it out somewhere where you don't have to concern yourself with seeing that part of the background, that's part of your framing aspect and how you would do that. So you can save yourself some trouble there. And we're going to do something here real quick. I'm going to do this just to try this because we talked about doing this just to see what... We, had, we were just going to throw this pattern on the back. Often, backgrounds are flat, so they will throw something on them to break them up and create some depth or that in them. In this case, it's what they call a kukulorus. A kukulorus is basically anything that is pattern-oriented. So in this case... See, and this one, because this one's so flat, this one is not, I'm going to have to get it up, see, closer to get a better line. But if you do this like with the background now, if I'm out, you can see that there is a difference in what it's done to bring down the intensity. And it's also broken up with the pattern of the light itself. So I'm just out of frame there. But if this were to even come around, You often can just do something like this to break the background up so that it isn't quite as flat. So now you've created more contrast in your background. And they'll often do that. I can just put it here. It's fine. Okay. Uh, in situations, like I say, they'll, it's often anything as simple as like a kookalorus, which is, if you know what one is, they're automatically identifiable when you see somebody use one. So people don't use them much anymore. They tend to make their own. Uh, which you can do pretty simply by cutting out holes, irregular holes in the card. Often on sets we'll take and we'll use a branch and just like if there's background light or something on there, then we might just take a C-stand and put a branch in it just to break that background up slightly and give it a more dappled effect if possible. So within the background. Sir? Oh, yeah, this is basically what a kook is on some levels. And when you'll see these in use, like I say, you place this and then you light to this. When you're lighting, like if there was a set, if say this was a couch, a TV stand, plants or anything else, then what you do is you'd light all those things independently. You'd put up something small, throw it down in the plant, put something flat up so that you don't hit the screen of the TV and see the reflection. Because you'll often notice that it's very, you know, cameramen are very careful not to make sure that their, their shots are reflected in cars and that kind of thing. And now with digital, I'm sure they can take a lot of that stuff out. You know, it's not quite what it used to be. But uh, you'll normally, like I say, in a case like this, that's why we're using these lights. We're not lighting the background in its entirety. We're just lighting portions of it so that it creates a degree of separation and depth. But the same thing like with a Kukulorus is you could create much broader patterns in those situations. So... Again, each light is going to respond differently and is going to have its own characteristics in regards to how it works and what it does. These are nice. So let's do, hmm, what was I going to do? Okay, let's do this. Let me try this. Now you can also, fill can also be done as bounce or direct lighting. That's not that angle, it's not the best. This is also a Fresnel instrument. Fresnel refers to the type of lens, it's a glass lens that's uh, circuloid pattern that 
the ribs on it focus the light in. And again, the light has a barrel adjustment, which was the cradle, which moves the light forward and back to flutter spot it. Oh, this one is 21? Now here you've almost balanced, it's almost, so you can actually see the color difference now between these two lights also. The uh, LED is going to play a little bluer uh, and the tungsten, this is a tungsten light, is going to be a little warmer like that. So that's kind of a mixed look and it's kind of strange really. But in situations like this you can again take Monsieur Silk. This is at full flood, or full spot, or no, this is full spot, I'm sorry. See how that's heating it up? Oh, that's actually, oh no, okay, I got it right the first time. But you can do again, and it's just giving that definition. Now this I would take and I would move this, I'd bring this around if necessary because it's causing a bit of a line. So half the time it's just a matter of moving because your people are going to move too. They're not, you know, they're not static. But uh, see that's better in there because now you can really see the definition against your cheek and the side of her nose. And again you've got that nice cast shadow there that gives her face some depth. So in this case, you can do it directly like this. You can also bounce light, which is often one way that... And we want to watch lenses. Come to me, my sweet. not the way the silk is supposed to be. Silks don't sleep on the ground like that. See, in the same way now that you can balance if you get something in, if you have an opportunity, and again, angle of reflectance equals angle of incident. So, however, so sometimes you can use direct light, you can use indirect light. Like I say, outdoors, you're going to want to use the sun as your key, but get it behind you so that you can set the illumination levels correctly. Otherwise, it just flattens everybody out. But the same way as like often you'll just put in bounce cards. Or in a big, if for instance, again, this was something that we were lighting with, uh, like say had a couch or even anything else, uh, we would light specifically to small areas. We would just light what we wanted, where we wanted it. So if we had a couch, we just put something in on the couch, bring in some top light over the top of TV, and then to bring in something, say, for a plant, so that you're creating these areas of light and dark that again create separation and give you the illusion of a 3D set, when in fact you're really on a two-dimensional plane. So, uh, and that air conditioning thing is running. Let me grab, oh, I was actually gonna grab, cool, I was gonna grab, this guy. This is diffusing gel. Gel comes in numerous types, color correction, uh, blue or tungsten, uh, often what's called CTO, color tungsten, uh, correctional tungsten, or CTB, correctional, which is blue. And those you'll often put on lights to change the color or to change the quality of the light. This is diffusion. This is something like what's called a 216 or something like that. This stuff comes all the way down to opal, which is very thin, almost membrane thickness, to very heavy pieces like 216, which again is similar to using a softbox, but it still gives you, but in this case, what you've got is the light itself maintains its quality as a lensed instrument but is substantially softened by using gel. Boy, 
definitely feels like a different person. And so you can see if you're taking this out and smoothing it down. And so that, I mean, to me, that's much nicer in regards to the fact now that you've got, I would almost take that key around slightly to take that eye shadow out from under her left eye. Uh, just take it around on that axis just that way, slightly. No, I'm sorry, you were, you were wanting to flat it out. My mistake, I'm bringing it the wrong way. Yeah, see slightly, just go back slightly. Yeah, right in there. But see then, and that, I would, I would almost take that back or dial that down now. See, and now you start to get a fairly nice rendition because you can actually, and then you just back this away slightly. And you can see what it's doing then. So a lot of times you'll, do, you'll go ahead and you'll just turn the light on and off. You can tell what it's doing, you know. And in this case, like I say, I don't have a light meter, so I don't really, uh, I can't really set what the ratios are. But more or less, you know, this is one, one and a half to one. More three or one on the far side versus the, the lit cheek. But again, so how you do this and where you move this, you know, if you bring it around, now it becomes almost a side light. Or even, again, something that would be like a kicker, oh, he said, would be more like this. Where you can see that it's illuminating that back cheek and the back of the neck and near the ear. So that's often what you'll do, like, if you're outdoors and you're shooting with the sun, you might put the sun behind you in so that it's working this kind of angle and then you would fill from the front because the other thing is is when you're shooting and you have the sun out you have to uh, you have to have a, in a position where you can actually use it so if it's behind you if it's coming at you this way you can't fill so if you've got the light there then you can get in front of the subject and fill easier so that's just one of the ways you do it. And again, bounce light as long as, as if your intensity or your instruments are big enough, then you could bounce both sides. But the thing is with bounce light also is that it's, it's kind of uncontrolled. It just goes where it wants. So you have to trim it and often uh, put it in boxes or do things like that to keep it from spraying all over the place. So that's just some basics on just how we would go about using these or any other subsequent light for that matter. Since you can mix and match sources, it's a question of making sure that your, uh, that the color and the ratios look right based on what you want to do because, you know, it's often that something that might not seem appropriate in one situation will be appropriate in another depending on what the circumstances call for. Uh, if your interview, I mean, even like if you were doing an interviewer of someone that was like a, crime novelist or something, you might want to create a different ratio and make it a little more dramatic than you would if you were talking to somebody about comedy or something. Uh, we did that on a series of interviews we did for Comic-Con Kids, is on some of the guys we changed it and made the ratios hotter and higher so that it, so it was a little more indicative of the type of work they did that wasn't quite just so comic booky. whereas some of them, when we lit the backgrounds and they were more straight animators, we put in yellows and greens and more uh, sort of comic book colors in a way. When we were doing like guys like Greg Bear who writes science fiction and other things, we were doing a little more purples, a little bluers, we were going changing the colors so that you had a bit of a sense of difference. And the lighting was somewhat different, but the background colors we swapped out a lot. And I think we were actually using this drape at the time, if I'm not mistaken. So, and again, this drape being the color it is, which is blue, the nice thing about it is because it's not flat, it creates a degree of dappling and gives you the illusion of contrast or break, it breaks up the light. And at the same time then when you throw other colors on it, it'll affect it differently. For instance, it really likes, it takes the reds nicely. And, uh, but then this is a green over here, or it's a, yeah, it's a pale green. Or it's almost a teal. Yeah. 
But then changing those colors changes everything on the background too in that situation. So it, again, you know, it's all about, you have to light what you need to see, but it's also, it isn't like you have to see everything. And a lot of times, uh, the bottom line is, is you want to focus the viewer's attention so you're lighting to that specific area as opposed to, say, lighting the whole thing flat, whereas it's less distinguishable as to what's really important because everything has the same ratio to it. So, but in some situations like this too, if we, if we had a setback here, then one of the things we might do when we were finished is we would get everything set on the main levels and then we might put bounce cards up here and just bounce light in just to fill this because we've got the key situations that are lighting the tree, lighting the couch, and lighting the TV, but then that fill light will just come in and create definition in the front for those things we aren't seeing because most of the light is coming from directly above. So we want to fill where we could with that. What, what do you want? What do you want? Oh, I'm not paying any attention to you. So that's, you know, that's just basic three-point lighting, and again, you can, you can expand on that, you can do it, you know, you can go this way for a key and then a fill or a kicker. You could bounce in, you can again add in different color to the backlight if you need to or anything like that. Uh, and that, that's basically three point light. I'm not sure how much more I've got as far as just doing three point stuff goes, you know? Okay. I mean, we just, like you say, we've looked, we've seen that the difference in the lighting and the type of lights that we've used and the color involved and the fact that basically, again, you're trying to come up with ratios on this. Let me look at my notes and see. Do you have any questions so far? God, if there's anything, yeah. Basic three point, shooting outside, shooting inside. And normally when you're shooting outside, they refer to it as available light or a light that's available. So you want to manipulate it if possible. And certainly uh, they used to have, it's north light is like using a window as your main key and then filling in, which is a way to do it, especially if you're seeing outside. Uh, again, if you're inside, your level is gonna be completely different than outside. So if you can avoid looking out a window, it's, gonna, it's gonna, just gonna burn out because you're having to open your exposure, your iris for your interior. So you wanna try and avoid that if possible. Use the light, but not look out the window. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Sort of a kicker or backlight, and you're filling with uh, Say a card ring. How do you cut the light? Well, with the fill outside, it's not important in most cases because what it's doing is that the the fill light is going to hit the individual, but if there's nothing else there, it's it's like doesn't it, it doesn't matter because it's like we actually used to do what we would call an air light, and an air light would be something like if somebody fell off a pier, you'd have to light the air they're falling through. So until there's something there, you don't even know it's lit because it's just light and space. And so it doesn't have a reflective ability or nothing to kick back. Whereas in here, you're going to see pieces. Whereas outside, it's just, you know, uh, it's just going to fade away in most cases. Unless there was something like if there's a lamp post or something there, then you're going to see that fill, in which case you need to change your angle or you can always bend your card. You could take a piece of... Uh, Duvetine, which is, uh, or something similar, which is, uh, Duvetine is a fire retardant black velvet that we use for a lot of things. And you can always drape part of it over your card so that that portion of the card is dead. And, uh, but in most cases when you're just filling, if there's not anything there to light or hit, you're not really gonna notice it. It's not gonna be anything there that's gonna be a problem for you. I yes, sir. I feel like mixing daylight and tungsten is kind of a rare thing to do, and it's led, you know, it's, it's doing something like that is definitely uh, led by your story. If for some reason in the scene you need to require blue and, and orange on your subject, are there any instances in the past where you can think of you mix daylight and tungsten? Yeah, if you're shooting inside, you know, and you're looking out a window, technically your interior, say it's lit, uh, say it's evening or even late afternoon, and you're seeing out the window. Your interior would be lit by tungsten, so it'd be warmer. And then your outside, you use daylight. Or you might not use them to such an extreme, say 32 Kelvin to 56 Kelvin. You may warm up the daylight to, say, 5,000 Kelvin, and then warm up or heat up the interior so they're a little closer in color temperature, but you still get that distinct look. The thing is, is unless the level inside matches outside, you're going to have to put what's called neutral density on the windows. 
neutral density or ND gels come in one, two, three, four, up to nine. And what they do is they reduce the incoming light that allow you still to see out. So what it does is it, it literally just takes the exterior and darkens it so that it matches the level that you have inside. So often doing that, and you have to use gel, and gelling windows is, that's, I think God came up with gelling windows as a punishment for somebody, because it's an awful job. Now it's completely different. I mean, now, I don't know who was smart enough to figure this one out, but they were like, yeah, if you use a squeegee bottle and you wet the window, the gel goes right on it. Okay, that was very intelligent. I don't know who came up with that one, but it certainly was before my time because I can remember doing windows. We did a thing at LAX once where we had to gel almost the whole damn terminal. It just took us hours. And we're talking 160 bucks a roll and we cut through like 18, 20 rolls of that stuff, you know? So we could see planes in the background moving, which, you know. But if you have some, some uh, lights like the LEDs and you, you're focusing on a subject, like we had a situation where we had daylight and we needed some fill light. So um, instead of using like the, the tungsten lights in the room, we, we just lit it with, a, with an LED. And that, and that way you can match the LED to the daylight rather than the other way around. Yeah, and that's why these are so much more flexible, you know? I mean, again, because before when you had film stocks, you had a film stock that was either rated daylight or tungsten, uh, as well as the lighting in and of itself. It didn't have the variable shutter or the variable dimming capability or the color shifting ability that these do. So uh, it, it, this is definitely going to be an improvement and ease in lighting. It's just that I don't think they've built a lot of big heads like this yet. You know, they're not making 24K LTDs, although they sure will soon enough. Uh, but uh, in, a, in a situation, say, like that, yeah, uh, you could, if you're using the sun as your key, then all you need to do is fill slightly, you know? If you're not, if it's at an angle, because if, if you're at just the sunlight on you, it's just going to flatten out. No matter what you fill, it isn't going to do anything, you know? I mean, because the sun is, you know, kind of powerful. I mean, remember somebody said something once about, I have some uh, set. It was like, oh, it's a 5.6. Oh, we're well, moving back. And I was like, god damn, you could move him to Cleveland. It's still going to be a 5.6. It's not going to change because... It's the sun, you know? But this guy had some kind of mind the same way that you'd use a light that you could move away and it would lower it. And I'm like, no, it doesn't work like that. So, but you know, again, outdoors and a lot of these things, you know, this is more controlled in the situation. Outdoors, you, you, you know, a lot of times you'll just turn, look at where the shot is. And especially if you're outdoors and you depend on what your framing is and how much you have to see, where your background is relative to your person is gonna be a lot more important. Whereas this is just a, just a sort of a created background. That one, again, you know, and I said this story the other day, I go, I was on the set of the man who wasn't there, the Coen Brothers movie, and Roger Deakins was talking about, rhetorically to himself, about if he put more light on this chair at the end of the hallway, how that would affect the whole movie. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of crazed, you know, considering this is shot in black and white, too. And, uh, in commercials, if you were to you know, look at that and you're like, well, what's that down the hallway? And the attitude would be is if they're looking at that, we're not selling the dog food. Because in the commercials, you want it up front, whereas movies deal more depth-wise. And while commercials will deal with that in a way, aesthetically and psychologically, it's like the message that's up front. So things are sort of like more closer to you in a way. It's a little different thinking. But uh, yeah, like I say, for basic three-point, that's about it, you know? Just the different types of sources, what you would do, how you could bounce, how you can soften a light, and how you can change intensities by, in this case, dimming, or on using a dimming board here. Uh, or again, proximity of the light to the individual and where they are. What about eye lighting? Often you will get that naturally from a key, but not always. In some cases, they will take and put, Panavision used to have a panel light, and it mounted right on top of the camera like a, like an ENG, electronic news gathering. And what it does is it doesn't illuminate as much as it just throws, all you see is you're reflecting that light in the eye. So eye lights often will, you can see them in the keys because the key being at 45 or wherever it's going to be, you'll normally see that reflected in the pupils. But if you don't, then what you'll end up doing, like I say, is you'll put just a small light. I've seen people do it with uh, mag lights literally right at the camera. All it does is because all you're using it for is to reflect light in that black part of your eye, which will kick it back. Which you can't, like I say here, they've got painted highlights on this girl. But uh, you'll see it more in, in, the, in, the, in the pupil. 
But, and it's often just a single light and you'll put it somewhere if you're not getting that effect you want from the key. Because you'll often, you'll see it, and you don't see it that often, but you'll see two, like, you might sometimes see two eye lights. And so you're seeing that the, the angles of those lights, and again, angle of reflectance equals angle of incidence. So if, if that reflection is here, then you can kind of get an idea where it's coming from. And sometimes that's why it looks straight on. It's coming right at camera, because I'll actually have a special light for that. Pan, like I say, Panavision did. I don't know if Aerie did, but we've often, like I say, we'll just keep it back there with a small light. Or you'll get something like a little tiny light that may be 200 watts, and then you'll put a snoot on it, which is a, a little cone, and so that all you're getting is just this little pin of light, and you're just throwing it right at the eyes. And so it'll illuminate the eyes without changing the balance on the face. I was trying to do that with one of these LTMs, but it's just too powerful, and I couldn't control it enough, so it would start to light more of the face. But it's just basically, again, because you're looking at the angle of incident, and if you want that eye light direct, you put it there. You want to move it, you can put it over on certain places. But then that light is specifically for that, whereas these lights are lighting a more of a person. Now you're starting to get into the very specifics on that. Uh, the same sort of thing, like if somebody comes in in a different shirt, if the shirt, you know, say an African American versus a white shirt, then you want to net it down. If somebody comes in and where they're wearing, I don't know, you're doing something for a union, who knows, and they've got a button on that's bright and is really highly reflective, they have uh, flags and cutters that are called dots and fingers that are literally, they're dots and they're fingers and they're little tiny flags. And so you'll put them in and literally, like in this case, if I was off camera, I could take something like a finger just like that and I could just take that button down and see I'm, I'm not even in frame. But here you can see that see now you've given more prominence to the face because you've taken that foreground down or just below their neck. So a lot of times that's what you know you'll cut. And again this line is softer if you move away and it's harder to cut often. But the closer you get that line will determine and it'll be sharp. So in this case then you can see that that changes the look right there completely. And this is just because it's cutting it, not just diffusing it. But say for something like this that's bright and shiny, you can always just So you're just, that's literally what a finger looks like. And when you, now you can see it, but if you lay it in somewhere like that, you can't really tell it's there, only unless you move it. But that takes that, that kick on that collar down slightly. So in situations like that, again, it's more control. Then if you have those instruments, then you can really start to fine tune what you want to see, what you don't want to see. That's why, you know, you've always got a ton of C-stands and a bunch of crap around because you're always cutting light. And in situations like this, in most cases, you're going to take and going to have box in the light on some level. So I would get cutters and I would box it in so that the light is going here and staying off the backgrounds, off the floor, or spilling onto anything else. So I'm trying to isolate it. And because of the inverse square law, which I cannot remember about, and that's about the fall, out of, fall off level of light, is that then if I did have a background set and this was spilling into it, I would want to box this or move it back to reduce that spill into the set because I've lit those areas specifically. And if I was going to fill the set, then I'd fill it overhead with more that would just bring the overall balance up, the illumination up. So some of that, is that making sense? Is that, yeah, I, like I say, I haven't done this in so long, and I don't think it's really changed much. I think the technology and the hardware has changed, but I don't think uh, really what we do is any different. Again, you know, and I was always told, you know, yeah, light what you need to see. You don't always have to light everything, and because, again, that's what you're using is that ability to create light and dark, to create a contrast, to try and create depth or the illusion of a three-dimensional space within a two-dimensional frame. Mm. So that's kind of pretty much what you're doing. Michael, is there much difference between lighting objects and people? Depends. Uh, I used to do a lot of cars. And one of the major things that changed in the automobile industry was in, I think, 85 when they introduced the Taurus. And the Taurus was a completely different car because it didn't have any edges on it. And I remember we got in the studio and we were like, this is like trying to light an egg because it's, you know, it's really tricky. So some objects, yes. I mean, cars, when you light cars, everything is bounce. You don't, I mean, if you go back and look at a car commercial from the 50s or 60s, you'll see these big hits on the car, the lights. Now, 
I mean, if this was cars, we put big, big soft overheads like this, hang them, sometimes 20 by 40s, and then run a huge wall of bounce here, and then we just start laying in 10Ks and bouncing all the light. And then the way we create lines in the car was we use sawhorses and duvetine, and then that way we would bring black up, and that way we could create definition in the car. But in that situation too, it's like because you're in a two-dimensional plane, we'd light each wheel individually from the back so that you could see where the, where the car was sitting and all this. So some objects, yes, some objects, no. Again, if they're highly reflective, uh, if they're round. Uh, I used to do a lot of food. You know, light and ice cream is no fun. It, it, it's got to be a hell of a lot easier with these things. But light and food can be boring as hell. But it's something that you have, and that's all to a large degree, bounce, controlled light, or small lights that are focused. So objects, yes, I mean, one of the things is reflectivity. Again, the relationship of the object to the background, its importance to the background, what you need to see. Uh, but some objects easier than others. You know, like I say, when we were doing those cars, it was just like, we, we didn't feel like we could hide the light because the car was curved. And now it's not a problem. I mean, they've developed these old other things. Like I say, they've got stages that are just built specifically for cars now, you know? And, uh, but they did a lot of that kind of stuff here, and this was all the dealer prep stuff for, uh, when they get a new car, they, they literally go and they shoot it for the dealers so they know what the hell's going on with the car. But it's like literally, they would roll these new models out from Detroit, and we'd be in the studio, and we'd have disassemblers there, and it's being like, I need the back seat out, and I want the windshield out. And they'd take this stuff out, and then we'd put our lights and our cameras where we had to, and then, okay, we need to put the door back, or we need to do the radio, so we gotta yank the front seats and the console out so we can get a camera in to do that. So in that case, then, again, this is a consistency object. You're lighting the car and all these particular parts, but you wanna create the same type of illumination. You don't want it to be dark here, light here, color, or this or that. So you, you have to realize, does this object fit with other objects in relation to them, and how do I have to light them? Do I pay more attention to one than another? You know, Framing and that kind of thing is also important too. Again, uh, having the ability to work around something, you know, wider frames are trickier. You need bigger lights because you've got to get the lights farther away and you've got to throw them farther. So the tight, tighter you can make your frame, the smaller lights you can get away with using often. But yeah, objects, that, they all call into question their own thing, you know, mirrors. I mean, often uh, on sets when you'll see things that are reflective, you'll often take like pictures and that kind of thing. They'll just take a big wad of tape and they'll stick it in the back and just angle the picture slightly so that you don't see the reflection anymore. But because you're in a two-dimensional plane, you don't see the fact that it's coming off the wall like that. It's just is slightly, you know. Or the other thing with objects often, uh, you use dulling spray, which on bright objects you can use or even, uh, we used to carry what are called streaks and tips, which is hair coloring. And it's, uh, it comes in all these different colors, gray, black, white, brown, blue, red. And you can use those. You can spray those on lights. You can spray them on things. And they will either change the color or reduce it. So that's one of the ways you'll take glare off or you'll, like with China hats, we would often put those. And then I would just spray the side of the globe with, say, gray or something just to bring it down if I didn't have a dimmer for it. But in most of those cases too is like those kind of small lights you can make pocket dimmers for. You can take a dimmer that they use for a house and you put a plug and a socket on each end and you've got a, you've got a real stat, you know? And then which works for small lights like up to a thousand watts. So you can do that. But yeah, objects, every object is, you know, it's almost like a person. I mean, to a large degree, every person lights a little differently depending on, you know, whether good side, bad side, skin, hair, uh, reflectivity of the forehead, whether they're wearing glasses, you know, if they're made up or not, what the contrast is between their clothes and their face. Uh, again, when I mentioned African Americans, in, in lighting someone who's black, you often will tend to use more bounce light than direct light because black objects just tend to absorb light whereas white reflects. So you'll often use bounce light to create a larger source that will then fill and wrap as opposed to one area. And part of it is too is that she isn't porous, which our skins are a little different. So she's gonna be highly reflective, whereas we're not gonna be quite that because our skin will absorb a lot of those UV when we're shooting in. So that's one of the things is that she's, you know, she's real shiny. Does that help somewhat? Because yeah, like I say, it's 
There isn't a, there isn't a quick and a fast rule, really. You know, it's. Uh, Have you ever done anything with, uh, say, there's a YouTuber and they want to use their lamp stick or something for lighting? Is it possible to make shift that into something? I'm not sure I understand. Say somebody who has a very low budget. Okay. You know, and they have a house lamp or they have this a standing lamp and they have kitchen lights. You can use, you know, uh, Robert Rodriguez shot his first film, uh, Mariachi, for $7,000. And he, the only lighting he had were, were two clip lights with 250 watt globes in them. You know, those standard sort of clip lights that you buy work lights at the store. And, huh? For your garage. Yeah. Yeah, and he did that. I mean, you know, uh, Sony took and bought the film and spent a half a million dollars running it through post for audio, but the film itself was beautiful. It was shot in this Mexican light, and the colors just pop. But there's a little bit of interior lighting, and he just had these handheld clip lights, you know? But you can do the same thing. I mean, fluorescence, okay? It used to be that fluorescents were designed originally for food and clothing. They make them look good. They are miserable. POSs of light because they don't have what's called a full spectrum. They do not have every wave of the lighting spectrum. That's why HMIs do, these do, tungsten do. That's why, like for instance, uh, so low sodium vapor. If you go outside and you see a street light that's yellow, that's a low sodium vapor light. And it doesn't have all the colors of the spectrum in it. Although this light may look blue, there are greens, reds, and all that mixed in. These ones, fluorescents, are also non-full spectral lights. They're gas infused. And so they're inconsistent and in regards to their look. They used to be, I mean, they were either green or pink. And they didn't come in daylight or tungsten, so you had to gel them. And that was a miserable job because you literally would have to, you know, you get gel, you buy it at 150 bucks a roll, and you're cutting it to put it in like those overhead lights like we've got in our offices. And you're putting them in to color correct those. And that was Every time I watch all the president's men and they're shooting in the newsroom, it's just a mile of fluorescence. And I was just like, oh, that was just probably brutal. But now they come in daylight and tungsten. So you can get a 3200 fluoro and a 56. And the film industry did that because the fluoro is making us crazy in the amount of money we were spending. So uh, certain lights are, you can do like make your own. For instance, I've actually gone into Home Depot and bought fluorescent work lights and use those to light backgrounds because they're smooth and even. And as long as I white balance to them correctly and I match them, then they're, they're okay. But then fluorescence, because of the gases in them, if they start to wear down, you get a color shift. When a light gets old or a light gets used, its color will shift. Uh, well, we used to use like big lights outside. If we had six 12Ks on the job, we would color temp all of them. And then we'd name them so that we knew which ones, you know, were like better or worse. Or which ones we knew we had to correct. And the same way with tungsten lamps, the, the older they get, the warmer they get. So as the lamp ages, it'll go from 32 to 29 in some cases. And in a lot of the big ones, they used to have tungsten lights that were like globes and they actually have carbon in them and you'd have to take this and then you'd shake the carbon in it so it would take the oxidation off the globe because when that filament burns it's literally burning up and it oxidizes the globe that can change the color temperature so but in answer to your question yeah there's a lot of things you can do you know I mean there's a lot of easy ways I mean I've seen people in low budget situations that use those like work lights you know on the little yellow stands and those are like two 500 watt lights that's a thousand watts of light you know uh, so in those situations, yeah, and even the clip lights or things like that. I used to have what I called a gag bag, and I kept all these things in there, and I had like, I had little tiny wooden plates that just had sockets on them because if I was doing something and it was cheap and I was in a hurry, if I had to get some separation, I could put it behind a couch and just plug it in and turn it on, and then there was something there. Or Christmas lights. I used to carry Christmas lights all the time because anytime you get into a bar or something, man, you throw the Christmas lights back in the in the cases with the beer in that, so it gives you that kind of thing. So a lot of those home uses, you can use this stuff, you know? I mean, it's, I used to have a lot of crap that was, people were like, what the hell is that? And I go, oh, well, it'll be just what we need if we need it, you know? So a lot of times you can solve that, and God knows, there's people on YouTube that are making stuff that's insane, you know? Dollies, rigs, all sorts of stuff, you know? Uh, 
The other thing is about the home lights and that thing is that what you have to concern yourself with when you're in a studio you don't have the problem because you have the electrical output or if you're outside and you have a generator you don't have to concern yourself too much because what you're going to do is you're going to be aware of how much power you're going to need. Here we have pretty much unlimited power for the amount of lights that are here. Uh, but if you are going to say use lights and you're in a location like a house you have to be cognizant of the fact that most circuits are only 20, 20 amps. So if you plug in a 2,000 watt light, you can get away with it, but anything more, you'll trip the circuit. So it's often knowing what your load balance is. So when you're shooting in the house, that's very important to determine what your electrical is. Pro years ago, back in the 80s, before they were really stringent about electrical codes and that, we used to basically what do what's called tying in. So we'd go in and I'd find the main panel in the building and I'd literally take the panel off and I'd go in there with a couple of hot legs and I'd clamp into the panels on the bus bars and drop a panel on the floor and then we'd plug into that. But then I would also have to check the load calculations to see what the building's taking. Because if I overload the system and suddenly I kill everything in the place, I literally blow the board out, you know, I've seen that happen before. So, you know, it's knowing, that's why some of the things, and this is kind of back to your thing about, you know, doing the Home Depot thing and building your own lights is that most of that stuff is meant to work on low wattage. So the opportunity that you have is you can plug them into walls. But you know, certain things, I mean, anytime you get a light above 2,000 watts, it won't even have a plug that you can plug into the wall. It'll be a Meltrick, it'll be a three pin, it could be a pocket, it could be any type of connectors, you know? Uh, one of the things that changed the industry is it changes so much now, like I say, when 19, 2007, 2009, uh, Anton, Aeroflex, and Panavision quit making film cameras. They just quit making them. They still service them, but they don't make them. Uh, and now with the lighting changes that are going on, one of the big things that happened in 84 was when the Olympics were in LA. Uh, that changed the industry completely because all the stuff we were using was all the stuff that they started dragging out of the studios in the 20s and 30s. Well, it's all open electrics. And when they came out there and walking around, they were just the fire marshals were losing their minds. They're like, you've got open electric everywhere. It's like, well, yes, yeah, this is what we do. We know not to put our foot in it or touch it, but the general public doesn't. And that changed everything. Suddenly all that stuff that was used for years went away. And they just completely you know, overdid that. So, and again, the tools change and all that. You know, I was at Comic Fest this weekend and they did, I saw a panel on Noir and they talked about the fact of the advent of small cameras, the Aeroflexes after the Second World War and the fact that they could actually take productions out into the street and off the studios, which changed the look of Hollywood to a large degree. And that was a European tradition already, was shooting. They, they, the whole neorealism uh, school of thought came out of uh, Europe as opposed to Hollywood, because Hollywood, you know, the reason you shoot on stage is because it's control. That's the thing that you've got here, is you've got control. I mean, if I put the sun in the corner, it's the sun is going to be the sun, whether it's 8 p.m. at night or 8 in the morning. Nothing's going to change. Outside, we're on this spinning ball that's flying through space, so everything's changing. So when you're lighting outside, one of the things that comes that's important is continuity. That's why it's often better if you can get out of the direct sunlight and work in something that's dappled, because while the light will change overhead, it'll remain relatively the same ratio. Otherwise, you're, you're having to you know, chase the light. And uh, I used to do a show called Greatest Sports Legends, and we shot these on golf course, and it was basically someone like Michael Jordan or uh, Reggie Jackson and ex-sports stars and they'd walk around and talk and then they'd sit down and talk and they'd cut in clips. Well we did all this without uh, any physical lighting. We did it all with grip equipment. We, man we, we manipulated the light. The thing about it was is what we shot at 8 in the morning looked exactly like what we shot at 4 in the afternoon, which is difficult because you have to keep changing things. So what we do is we put on big overheads and we knock the light down and then we build it back up underneath using the external light that's moving around but now in the square we've controlled that direct light. So while the sun moves, I move my shiny board, I'm still lighting the same person the same way. It's just angle of incident equals angle of reflectance so I have to move this but all day long under that silk it looks the same. So we can shoot all day with that continuity and that's a problem. I mean you see scenes takes them three days to shoot. It's a four minute scene. It's all outdoors. Well, guess what? It all looks like it shot one time and that, that can be tricky, you know? So, and that's, that's often, I mean, I've done shoots where it's like, okay, the available light was good. 
Uh, we did a Budweiser spot once down at uh, 10th Street Terminal, and the DP was, I can't remember, was one of these big, big guys out of Hollywood. I don't know if it was Jordan Cronenweith or not, I can't remember. And they basically made us pull all the big lights off and set them all up, and then they came over and they looked around and they went, and he went, well, I think we could have coffee till about three in the afternoon. And so we waited for the light. And then by God, if at one point it was just like, okay, we gotta shoot right now. And we shot for 20 minutes and went away. But he had the lights in in case we had to bring them. But his whole thing, he was paid like 25 grand that day just to say, now, right now. You know, and it was one of those weird days where it's like we were all ready to work and do all this stuff and be ready to prepare and, and deal with all the changes in lighting. But Sky stayed right. He thought it was right at that point, And they shot the thing available light, you know, right there. We didn't put a shiny board in, a fill car. We did nothing. And the spot was beautiful, you know. It was beautiful. I mean, it was, and I didn't see exactly what he had seen because those guys, they're, they're aliens. They, they see something we don't. They're like dogs and they see, see spectrums I don't think we can see. But the thing was, is all the reflections on the water and the sun and all this, I mean, this thing was gorgeous. And to look at it, it looked like it was lit. Because I was just like, man, it didn't look like available light. But it was that available light that only lasted that long, you know. That's why what they call golden hour, like shooting at, at, in the evening, uh, because the light is so beautiful. And that's one of the things, like during the day, if you go into shadows and look at a clear day, the light will be blue because you're not seeing sunlight, you're seeing sunlight reflected off a blue sky. When you get out into the sun then, it'll warm up. But you take pictures on a bright day in the shade and they'll damn near come out blue in a lot of cases, skin tones. So uh, that again is, is why like a golden hour, you're seeing the sun at this angle, it cuts through the atmosphere and that's why it's all orange. Whereas during the day, you just don't see that. You know, and then you'd shoot for that, but then that's a 20 minute window. And I was doing stuff for Chevrolet where we were shooting, we were shooting so far past golden hour, we were having to st stop the film rate down to the point we were opening the iris up and we were shooting at six frames a second so that we could gather more light. So we were literally, as the sun was going down, we were just doing everything we could to get the camera to see more and more and more, which meant stopping the shutter rate down and opening up the iris, you know. So, but those are all factors that are relative to what your background is because the minute you start changing focal length, that's, that affects your background and what you see and all that. And so that again is something that you're cognizant of early, especially like with objects too. If you're going to light the object, you're not going to light it to the point that you've got an F8 or something so that you can see all the way past it. You're going to want that background out of focus so that the object in, in question is being paid attention to. Otherwise, your eye's going all over the place. So, it's not a long answer to your home to depot thing. But yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I'm amazed at what people do on, uh, on YouTube, some of the things they make, you know. Anything? Anything? Any other questions? Not that informative, but you know, hopefully. All right, thank you very much. Hey, no, thank you guys. I appreciate it. Oh, and I want to show you.